This special meeting of the Judson Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 5.30 p.m. I'm very pleased that you have taken time to join us this evening. In compliance with the State Government Code on open meetings, tonight's agenda has been appropriately posted. We have established a quorum, and I'll do a roll call. Start with Mr. Diaz. Rafael Diaz present. Do you have your microphone on, Mr. Diaz? Rafael Diaz present. Okay. Yeah. Ms. King. Shatanya King, present. I didn't think your microphone was on. I'm not sure. Brianna, did you hear him? Okay. Ms. King. Shatanya King, present. Ms. Kenoyer. Suzanne Kenoyer, present. Ms. Rodriguez. Jennifer Rodriguez, present. Ms. Eaton. Deborah Eaton, present. I'm Renee Pichel, present. And to my immediate left is the superintendent of schools, Dr. Jeanette Ball. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Ball. Thank you. I'd like to um, welcome everybody and thank everybody for joining us today. And today we're going to talk about Judson ISD growing and planning to move our district forward. So we're excited to spend the next hour with our board talking about what it is that we can do to make sure that we move our district forward. Dr. Fields is leading this charge for us, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, I, I really would like to start off with introductions again. I, I know that you guys just went through the roll call, but I don't think the microphones were on, so for the recording purposes later. Um, our board president, Ms. Pashal, um, our superintendent, Dr. Ball, vice president, Ms. Kenoyer, Ms. King, uh, Mr. Diaz, Ms. Rodriguez, and uh, Ms. Eaton. And then the senior staff is here today. We've got um, Ms. Uh, Robinson, and Ceci Davis, and Mr. Atkins, Marco Garcia, and Helen Keaton, who is the Executive Director of Facilities, uh, Ruben, who is the uh, Director of Facilities, and Jose, the Assistant Director of Facilities, and then Ms. Greathouse, who is um, the uh, Director of Communication. And I'm Rob Fields, uh, mm -hmm. Deputy Superintendent of uh, Administration and Operation. And like Dr. Ball said, we're trying to get through the growth and planning and kind of get an idea for what the board has in store for the next five to 10 years. But before we move on, we also have an architect working with us on this project, which is Mr. Carr Hornbuckle. And I'd asked him to come up and kind of introduce the staff that you brought along today sure. as well. Thank you, Dr. Fields. So my name is Carr Hornbuckle. I'm with Pfluger Architects. Uh, I have a group of colleagues who have joined us tonight uh, as we go through our discussion together. So I'll go ahead and introduce them now, and you'll meet them more when we break into our individual groups. In the back, I have Amanda Garza, Lindsay Milligan, Robin Popa, Heather Blasey, Christian Owens, and one more colleague is on his way, Desmond Odunsi. Desmond is uh, texting. He got caught in a, there's a uh, wreck apparently in New Braunfels. So mm. he's slated his ETA by his GPS as he's going to be here about 15 more minutes. So before we get into why we have the growth and planning meeting, I also wanted to mention that we have Ms. Holmes here, who is the board secretary. So Dr. Ball, if you could give us a little background on how we came up with growth and planning. Yes, ma'am. So if you remember, we discussed having different committees this year. Um, and one of the things that we have spent a lot of time doing is our strategic plan developing our definition for leadership, our vision, and our mission. And basically what it is, is what our promise is for our community of Judson ISD. So we know that parents have lots of choices nowadays. So what, it's not like when we went to school that parents didn't have a lot of choice, but parents have choices now. And what we want to do is make sure that when parents select to bring their child to Judson ISD, that it meets all their needs. Of course, their academic needs to provide a rigorous instruction for them. Um, and then also all the extra services that make school fun, whether it's the athletics, the fine arts, CTE, and so much more. Nowadays, a lot of times, parents are looking for specialties. They're looking for something that's unique and that meets the needs of our students. 
So what we want to do is take this time, not only with this committee, this is designed specifically for the board to give input. So tonight we will specifically hear from the board starting Monday, the 15th of March, then that's when the entire committee comes together with the two board representatives, which is Ms. Rodriguez and Mr. Diaz. And the entire committee then starts to flush out what the board wants to see within our district and gets very specific and really starts to see how do we move, how do we plan to move our district forward? So if you think of why we're here today, we're here to discuss how is it that we're going to make Judson ISD the premier district and continue to grow and attract more students to our district. So tonight is specifically developed to hear from the board as to what are some of the things that you would like to charge us with. Thank you so much, ma'am. So really what we want to cover tonight is there are some things that just can't be accomplished in the normal m and budget or the budget that um, Mr. Atkins goes over with the board. And things have to sometimes be done outside of that capacity. So we want to go over some of the bond elections that we've had in the district going back to 2001. And then the 2016 bond and 2017 bond were the big ones. And we had a bunch of infrastructure improvements and we want to give you an update on where we are with those. And then Mr. Hornbuckle is going to come up and start talking about, okay, now where are we going going forward? And what are some things that are happening in architect and construction and the layout of academics that we may want to be concerned about as we move forward as well? And then we'll break out into groups, have some discussion and sharing, and um, come back and then kind of report out and they have an exercise for us to follow. So the first thing is a recap of the bond elections. If you would look up, or look on the uh, slide, it shows 2001. So back in 2001, there was a need for an increase in elementary schools. So 2001 bond brought about Hartman and Salinas Elementary, in addition to Metzger Middle School and Wagner High School, which were later completed around 2004, 2005. But what you see is we had one in 2001 and then 2006, <clears throat> an attempt in 2010, and then a successful 2013, but you can see we're at about four to five, maybe six years that we'll go in need of needing to, to do another bond. So in 2006, there was a need again for more elementary schools based on our demographics reports and what we saw with our student attendance. So the creation of Masters Elementary, Converse Elementary, Rolling Meadows Elementary. And I would say that Masters and Rolling Meadows Elementary were new. There was already a Converse Elementary, but we then created a new Converse Elementary where those students went into. And then that was also the creation of JECA. And um, the Judson High School rebuild, everybody remembers the old red and gray campuses. That's when we brought it under one roof. And then facility renovations and technology upgrades. Then in 2010, there was a need for another <coughs> elementary school or two more elementary schools and a need for a high school, the one that we see sitting up north now, some facility renovations, technology upgrades, and there was also the recommendation for a transportation satellite in the south end of the district. So we wouldn't have all those dead miles just driving from Judson to Wagner to pick up kids, drop them off over there, and then driving back up to Judson. And then some support facilities as well. That particular bond was unsuccessful, but Immediately in 2013, we came back, and after readdressing some of the elementary school needs, we saw that we were able to create the second high, the, the third high school, comprehensive, and create another elementary school, which was Copperfield. And that was in 2013. Six years later, there was a need for some facility renovations that weren't accomplished in that 2013 bond. So when we came back this time, a lot of the 2016 bond was the modernization and improvement of some of the facilities throughout the district and facility renovations. In addition to two new, high, uh, two new elementary schools, which were Escondido and Wortham Oaks, also in that proposition was Veterans Memorial High School. And then uh, a payback of the, it says bond debt, but I think that there was some work done at Kirby, correct Mr. Atkins? And um, 
there was a like a little corporation set up to pay for that and we wanted to pay that back with the bond. When that bond went through, everything, all the propositions were successful except for Proposition 3, but immediately after readdressing the needs, we came back in 2017 and it was approved. And the second phase of Veterans Memorial High School was then implemented. Now that we've showed the history of the bond, I'd like for Helen to come up and kind of give you some feedback at, oh, well, hold on. Yes, on exactly where we are in a lot of those infrastructure improvements, keeping in mind that we had five years to complete most of the stuff that we had put in, and almost every facility in the district had <coughs> something that was supposed to get done. So, Helen? Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members, uh, good President Pashaw and Dr. Ball. So what we're showing here, we're trying to show graphically for you because it's a lot of information. And so what we've done is we've uh, graphed out, and so you'll see a pie chart. What the pie chart represents in the green is all the projects that we've completed. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the 2016 bond, we came back and we did a lot of improvements to a lot of campuses. So one of the things that we did was uh, adding full service kitchens at many of the campuses because we were um, working out of a central kitchen for that. And then we've done some administration upgrades, uh, um, sewer replacements, all kind of different <coughs> uh, maintenance projects as well. So the good news is um, we're 75% complete with uh, a lot of the projects. We still have 23% that are underway. Um, 8% that uh, are ongoing in design at the very beginning stages and 2%, one of which is uh, Converse, which is on hold. So um, on the map to the right, and you can't really see it, but there's little yellow dots. Uh, inside the dots, it shows you the percentage where we are. So we've made great strides. All of this has happened in the last five years. So. Veterans Memorial came out of that, were the Mokes, uh, Escondido. So you've got some new schools and a whole lot of renovation projects. I think the important note here is that we've gone from the creation of new facilities to the renovation of current ones to over, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was 180 projects. Uh, 183 that needed to be accomplished throughout the district, ranging from uh, 60 million to 300,000. And they've been able to accomplish that, and we are well on our pace of completing that prior to the end of 2021. So a yeoman's effort from the facilities department. Now, what we use to determine where we're going in the next five, 10 years. Typically, what we're using is a demographics report, and we have a demographics company that's in the process of putting one together for us now. But it, this shows, and this is the same slide that you guys saw in the budget, the, um, the budget workshop, and it shows an increase. When we project, like if you see on the last one, it says 21-22, so that's a projection for next year, and you'll see a slight decrease in terms of the projection. When we do that, it's typically because, definitely with Mr. Atkins, he is really good with money and very conservative. <laughs> so we don't, we don't plan for a bunch of people to be here. He's very conservative about his projections. And in the past, he's been under and we've really gone, we've really done well in terms of uh, what we receive versus what we planned for. So uh, <laughs> congratulations to him as well. But you'll see that same uh, prediction here. In the last two years, though, with um, the advent of pre-K on steroids under Dr. Ball's <laughs> direction, we have gone up tremendously in the district in terms of our numbers. Where other districts have decreased, we've gone up. And um, you can see that in our projections, we're noticing that our current numbers should stay or either get more. So when we look around and we start seeing some of the demographics reports that come in, you'll see that a school like um, Kitty Hawk Middle School has almost 1,400 students. 
which is a lot for middle school and our largest in the district. So eventually there needs to be some relief in that area. We'll see that uh, a school like Copperfield Elementary has really high numbers and it's over there in an area where there's really not a lot of support for us to move other students somewhere else. Um, same thing with Rolling Meadows. Although we built Wortham Oaks, Rolling Meadows still has a bunch of students over there. So I would ask that as we move forward and as we go through this thought process and the discussion tonight, that we think about what you've had revealed to you through your constituents that you represent and give us that feedback so then when we do sit down with the Growth and Planning Committee on March 15th, we know how to say what the interest of the superintendent and the board is. So next up is um, Mr. Hornbuckle. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Yes, sir. We have spent some time preparing for our conversation tonight. Um, Dr. Ball has given us a really great charge in terms of working ahead towards um, convening the Growth and Planning Committee with your other community members. Mm -hmm. But while our charge is to help um, work through that committee's process, what we really want to do is be sure that everything that we're accomplishing is happening through what you all sense from a governance point of view Judson ISD needs to do going forward. And I think what's key about that is if you think about that from the point of view of so often we find ourselves focused on what's happening with our students today. That's never been more the case than in the past year because of everything that's happened with COVID, with remote learning, everything that became such a, a critical immediate need. Frankly, even in the past two weeks with the weather, we've seen that. But from a long range planning point of view, we really have to think about that as a longer arc. We're thinking about the students we have now, but also the students yet to come over the next five years, the next 10 years. And all of those students are gonna need opportunities. And those opportunities are gonna be continuing to change. I mean, we've seen that already. We're gonna to continue to see that. Now, of course, I'm coming to you as an architect, so I'm thinking about facilities, the buildings, you know, how do our spaces work? And all too often, we find ourselves with spaces that have hardly changed from an educational point of view. You know, how do we create infrastructure that best supports what it is that curriculum instruction wants to be able to accomplish? You know, what the vision is for the district, for each of your students. And so I don't really want to spend too much time talking because I think tonight's more about listening. And where we're headed from here is to ask all of you to work in groups and think about some, some aspects of this. We're kind of trying to break it down into digestible pieces. There's really three topics that we have in mind to, to bring some focus or bring some clarity to tonight. The first topic is addressing technology. Technology as it is used mm -hmm. by students technology as it engages students. I think Judson has already made such great strides with your one-to-one -one initiative. But the thing about technology is that you're never really done. You can't ever really check that off a list. And what we're seeing with other districts is so much more opportunities for creating different types of engagement through technology. We're actually working on a project right now with another district in North Texas that's building the first of its kind gaming um, magnet school, you know, for students to learn how to code towards creating gaming technology. Uh, we're, we have to think about technology, not just in terms of its, its use or its application, but also what it means in terms of how students want to be able to get engaged and we're capturing their imagination as a part of that. The next area that we really think about with regards to that is just how we're preparing them for what happens beyond graduation, whether that's heading towards college or working towards a career. Um, more and more of what we're seeing from a facilities point of view is that school districts are having to really create state-of-the-art facilities that emulate the, the um, professional spaces 
that students will be in for their careers. You know, they're working towards certain certifications, but even if they have that certification, are they really prepared to go out and venture into the working world? Um, a lot of student, a lot of uh, schools are creating uh, simulation labs for health careers, so so that you're you're getting the feel of being in a hospital or a care facility. Uh, the same thing is true if you're working towards um, not only learning a career but learning a business skill. So perhaps it's a cosmetology program, but do you understand how to actually run that as a business as well? And I think the other key point here to make and to think about is that while a lot of um, career readiness tends to be something that you consider at a high school level, districts more and more are seeing that kind of um, planning happen at a much younger and younger age in terms of sparking a student's imagination, letting them think beyond just what's happening on a curricular basis uh, in a fifth grade reading class, but really what are they learning towards? You know, what's the larger goal that they want to accomplish? The last prompt that we've identified is specifically around that idea of student choice and opportunity. I mentioned already, you know, many districts are trying to create very specialized magnet programs. I think Judson has um, taken their own great step in that direction with the idea of creating open enrollment. You know, students have the option to pick uh, their uh, campus of choice throughout the district and not be strictly tied to a geographic boundary. But once they've made that choice to go to a different campus, what is the opportunity there? What might draw a student from one campus to another? You have a program like JSTEM where students can focus in a specific area, but what other areas might there be for a focus, for um, a, a more in-depth learning model that's supported by what's happening in the core curriculum. So with that in mind, we're actually going to move for the next 25 minutes or so into three different groups and ask you all to uh, talk about these ideas in your groups with members of the senior staff. Um, we're going to have a, a group, I'm calling it Table One. We're going to split into three different rooms, actually, so that everything can be recorded. We're going to have Table One uh, remain here in the boardroom. And we're asking that group, Group One, to consider more in depth that technology rich needs topic. Group two or table two is going to move to conference room A uh, and you all will be looking at that second prompt thinking about college and career readiness. And then our third group is going to meet in the curriculum conference room. And that group is going to think further on this idea of student choice. And as a way of heading into that, I want to go back and reshare something that was on Dr. Ball's introductory slide. So she posed to us as we were getting ready these three questions, these three ideas of where do we go from here? And I think this is the type of question to consider and answer when you're thinking about your particular topic. I'll give you a little bit of a um, heads up on what we'll do after we've talked about this in each of our groups. We'll all come back in here and reconvene. We want to have a spokesperson, one of you from each of your table groups, share information about what you all talked about. And, and that's part of what we're here to help facilitate. So we're actually going to be taking notes and helping kind of guide that conversation. There's a flip chart like this in each room. So we'll scribe the information as the conversation moves forward. And then after you all have shared that, that gives you a sense of what all three topics have covered, and we'll start to identify some priorities within that that are important to all of you within each of all three groups. So with that, Dr. Fields, I don't know if there's anything else you want to uh, say. Only that um, we will go back. Where's P for previous? There you go. Those are the names and the, the groups again. Uh, table two is going to go to conference room A, table three into the uh, curriculum and instruction. Matter of fact, if you just follow Ceci Davis, she'll walk you around there. And table two can... Oh, I apologize. Right, they can follow Marco or Dr. Ball. I apologize. 
And then pick a person who you want to report out or direct someone that they're going to do it with. <laughs> Depending on your leadership style. That was quick. You picked yours right away. Are you killing the wasp, Dr. Huh? Did you get the wasp? I got him. I got him. I got him. He's our Manu Ginobili. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bad killer. Algo así. <laughs> Do we need to unplug this thing? How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Robin? Oh. Who's doing today? I'm doing great. Man. I don't know where she is. No, her stuff is still there. Although I made a mistake, I was trying to see it on the item. So you're facilitating? Good one. 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 Good Weird how that happens. you want to keep. I like those shoes, uh, sister. <laughs> I put them on and it reminded me it's been so long since I had a pedicure. <laughs> You're gonna be in here with us? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, um, my name is Robin. These are car is going to be kind of circulating around. The gentleman that he mentioned is running late is actually going to be joining us when he, when he arrives. And we're the technology-rich group. So I'm just going to write as you all talk and converse. If we hit some lulls, I may ask some questions to kind of maybe prompt some conversation. It's going to look probably a little scary on the board for a little bit. But once we get to the end of our, as far as like my terrible handwriting and stream of consciousness writing. <laughs> but once we get towards the end and we're kind of wrapping up, I'll take all of those notes, condense them down to some nice, succinct phrases for the follow-up activity afterwards. So, so I know one of the things that we want to consider as we talk about our technology-rich um, needs for Judson IFC students is how do we keep Judson IFC competitive in this um, educational market that we have. As we mentioned, the, um, parents have a lot of choice nowadays. So how do we ensure that Justin <coughs> ISD stays as a, com um, a competitor in that market and has um, equal footing to attract those students? Um, how do we make sure that there is equity across the district as far as thinking specifically about technology and um, those sorts of like more and hardware and device technology. and access? And then also, how do we ensure that whatever tools and devices and infrastructure that we're doing is uh, preparing our students to um, meet the needs of the workplace and a post-high school uh, educational career? So, so with that, I'll um, let anybody start off with a, a thought. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you said infrastructure because it would seem to me that um, in order to, we ran into that problem. 
you know, in order to be able to accommodate all of those students, we found out we didn't have the infrastructure for the entire district, not for the entire district. And so um, that was something that we had to act on quickly. Do you mean like wireless uh, mm -hmm. access or? Broadband access. Band broad bandwidth? Wireless uh, devices. De mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was something that hit us really hard at yeah. the very beginning and it was the most critical time. So fortunately we jumped on it right away. That was specific to um, what we've recently encountered re related to remote learning mm -hmm. with COVID? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know if that was a known issue prior to that? Some students were in the classroom? Or was there a need for students to be accessing district technology when they weren't in the classroom? And was there a deficit in that? Not that I'm aware of, um, but then again, at the time, and, 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 and Ms. Davis, jump right on in. We weren't one-to-one -one at that oh, moment. We were not one-to-one. -to -one. So yeah. it, when we switched to remote, mm -hmm. obviously that we were thinking about one-to-one -one in the future and preparing our access points for um, Wi-Fi, but we had to do it right away. This, mm -hmm. this led to that. So, at that time, we knew we weren't prepared to do it this year, but this year drew a mm -hmm. different situation mm -hmm. with COVID. We mm -hmm. were planning for it for the later future. Right. Yeah. And and that is why we had actually just upgraded to 10 gig from one gig mm -hmm. because yes. we had some issues wow. with the program. We were at one gig. And mm. then when we looked at okay, what if we have every teacher and every student right. zooming, trying to come through our system, well then we went to 20 gig. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we still need to build out yeah. some of the far part of our network mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to be able to support more, more bandwidth. Yeah. How does the technology needs differ um, at an elementary level versus a secondary level? Well, I will say that at the secondary level, we have the needs could go beyond just a simple Chromebook. Right now, we're ensuring that every student has a device, but that device might need to go beyond a Chromebook when we're talking about specialty classes, especially in CTE, when we're talking about computer science, cybersecurity, a Chromebook's not enough. Mm -hmm. So we we would need to expand that part to have specific laptops. Mm -hmm. um, the needs for maybe we want to think of our receiving lobbies. Um, we were talking about how a, like when you go to a doctor or dentist, you, you tell the family to check in, they're trying to register, you can just hand them a smaller device other than a Chromebook for them to just check in the way you do in, in, in a doctor's office. Mm -hmm. um, that would improve, I think, our customer service. Um, make it more efficient. Just out of curiosity, <clears throat> not a judgment statement. I always preface this. <laughs> you can't see my face too well on the mask. But like, we knew that we needed this, right? It was underappreciated at best. Correct. How long ago did we know we needed the infrastructure? Um, and I know that, organizationally speaking, I know that most of you weren't here. I discovered that fairly quickly I, when I arrived. I didn't here. know. It. We had the problem until Imagine Learning came along. And that's when I found out. I, I couldn't believe we were only at one gig. I mean, in my previous yep. district that had five schools, we were at 10 gig. Correct. Um, and I was just amazed. But the way our network was built, I'm not saying anything against anybody, but everything was in house. Mm -hmm. Everything ran through our. So mm -hmm. we didn't need that bandwidth because mm -hmm. we weren't going down the internet. Mm -hmm. But that's just, you, you can't afford to do that anymore. That's not where the world's at. The world's in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to start moving that way as well. The first thing we had to do was get our bandwidth straight. So we didn't need it. We didn't need it because we weren't implementing technology, right? I mean, arguably we needed it. We just hadn't invested we, in technology. Correct. We were so, kind of behind in the technology. technology. And Absolutely. the reason why I bring this up is because I want to keep something central, which is, Ensuring that, like, the conversation today, as most organizations and systems know, 
we're going to talk about what we should have been doing like 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and that we wasn't appreciated because it wasn't as possible and as obvious. Mm -hmm. So this is like super old school. Mm -hmm. Let me take that back. Not old school. <laughs> this is late. But I also want to keep focused on not underappreciating the things that we should be doing. So we're playing catch up, but then to Carr's point, we're also planning for future. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and y'all have a better insight, especially you, Susie. Um, what educational modalities and deliveries and systems are we not using that we probably should? Like, if we had a magic wand, what is it that we probably should be implementing that way we? We keep focused on not just the catch up, but like really get ahead of it. So, one of the things that TA has talked about a lot recently and is providing um, innovation zone grants to implement blended learning face to face. I know you've heard the word blended learning right now virtually, but it's meant to be a face to face um, modality in which student, the classroom is equipped with technology where a student has the ability to receive a direct instruction mini lesson in one corner. Then you have a corner that's technology rich, kind of like a maker space within the classroom, a mini maker space mm -hmm. within the classroom. So the students... Define a maker space. Uh, oh, For okay. me. <laughs> so, um, so like libraries now, whereas in the past they used to be filled with shelves of books, they're now filled with a space that has computers, 3D technology, um, just equipment, the ability for them to come in and complete a project that could be assigned in any content area. So it's just filled with... So like a space. Almost I'm a lab. Yeah. Hands on, manipulative. Ha correct. So that any student who wouldn't have any of this material at home would be able to come into. So back to the classroom, in every classroom to be designed to have a, a space with a modular furniture, um, very well access to Wi-Fi so that you could be in any part of the class and not lose connection. That would apply to our classrooms, our hallways, which are also collaborative spaces, mm -hmm. and parking lots for our families when they are working in the evening, et cetera. So that, mm -hmm. that, that is the standard classroom as you see it in 10 years from now. It's now in some. It, it's now definitely yeah. now, but the no, but that's like right. that is special. Limited districts have that ability today. Correct. In ten years, that'll be the norm. Absolutely. That, that style. I believe so that's what we have to implement. Um, what I'm hearing you say, Rafa, is um, have you been to um, the Cast High School? Yes. That school was designed specifically for the purposes of spaces, available spaces to connect. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily in a classroom, they're in a pod. Mm -hmm. And they have all of the, and um, Cast High School is SEISD, right? Yeah, no, Cast Tech. Okay, Cast Tech. Yeah. And, and, and so it's more, I mean, it looks like a living room, you know, and they're sitting, but they're working, and they're they've got their assignment, and and I'm thinking that's what you're talking about, Rafa, is that you're saying going forward, that's more or less what the traditional classroom would look like. Yeah, because I just don't want to be and having bound, the act like I don't want our conversations to be bound by the limitations of today. Yes, I understand. Right, so. You know, if we reverse engineer, what does that look like? Yeah. If you tell me that the standard in 10 years of standard will be this, mm -hmm. then how do we plan to get there quicker? Because I don't want to get there in 10 years and then be behind again. Yeah, right. Would you, Faces and, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, would you um, say that then planning or designing or whatever sort of aspect that you're doing is done with the notion of flexibility and expandability in mind? 
you want to introduce yourself? No, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I want to know who you are. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we were, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I apologize. Uh, uh, my name is Desmond O'Dunnessy. I'm an assistant project manager at the Austin office. Uh, so I've just come in to help you all and assist in your technology needs and help out, help out with the planning in any way that I can. Uh, personally, I'm pretty close closely knit with the technology needs of different districts right now working in central Texas. So if any way that I can be of assistance, I'm really looking forward to it. And the math kind of hides half the face that he is a younger <laughs> he brings the young I, blood. I, I, I wasn't sure that he was a student. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's, that's really great, you know. I, I actually went to school right here in San Antonio, uh, awesome. UTSA. I'm from Houston. But I've um, cool. been out for longer than I'd like to admit now. And, uh, <laughs> 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 Not long enough for all of Not long enough for them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, not for them, apparently. <laughs> but uh, living in Austin for the last several years, but it, it's been an amazing, amazing experience. So just to let you know, our topic of conversation is technology rich in environments and these are the questions that we're kind of charged with discussing. How do we keep Judson IC moving forward? How do we improve equity within the district and how do we prepare the students um, for life beyond school? And so just as a recap, um, Ms. Tuscal and Mr. Diaz are board members. And then Mr. Atkins and Ruben, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Sethi Davis. Ms. Davis are our senior staff with the district. So I've been just, as they've been having this great conversation, we're just writing notes. We'll clean it up at the end when we're just about done, but the conversation's been, it's been good so far. So keep going. <laughs> Sethi, can I ask a question? I heard you mentioned the, the library and the makerspace in the library. Do you envision that being an extension of the classroom, like a resource, much like how kids now go to the library and pick up a book, but it's a place where they can continue their study? And the time today, the teaching in the classroom is a standalone to the librarian to use. It is a standalone for the librarian to use, but it's okay. standalone and students can go visit okay, and complete exactly. their projects okay, there. So yeah. both, both hand in hand, you can take yeah. place. And you want those same type of spaces available within the classroom itself, within the, the confines of the classroom? Absolutely, because I'd love to see our type of instructional modality move away from just the teacher giving and the student receiving. Mm -hmm. So if it is more of that, of, you know, I envision the modular furniture, the ability mm -hmm. for students to sit down maybe for a mini lesson, but then get up and work in, in groups, being able to go to one corner of the classroom, have screens so that they can plug in and show their peers what they're learning as the project is being built, they can look at it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Very much collaborative. Yeah. Circle back to the question that Carr had asked about um, viewing the differences in technology or devices um, between secondary and elementary. So we talked a little bit more. We talked a little bit about how at the secondary level it's likely a more robust offering because the coursework is more rigorous as far as um, technical aspects. <coughs> you know, the RAM and all that sort of stuff that kind of goes with more advanced study. What do you see that might change in elementary school level when it comes to technology, devices, um, how that begins to move towards the future? Is it that different, though, Ceci? I think... Like, sure, the workload is different, right? But the infrastructure, is it different? I think, at, like, for certain CT courses, I could see that you would want a computer that is built differently mm -hmm. than a computer sure. that you sure. would be able to put in a K-1 yep. pen. Sure. I fine. do, however, see that some of our students in kinder and first are more tech savvy than mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I'm thinking, and I don't know if that's part of the bond, but also the applications that would be put in a computer because those sometimes are purchased okay. separately. Would they be part of technology fund? Probably not the, not the applications. Okay. I know that's a great question. So for instance, for me though, is this conversation based on building the facility that we need to power this? Or are we talking about the actual, like a technology line item in the bond? Both. Oh. Okay. Keep, keep in mind that we're talking about 
how do we address the technology rich needs for our students? Yes. Just in general. So, Just uh, in general. So my question to you, the reason why I asked is because, yeah, I agree the device itself is different, but the space, is the space any different? I know. Because I want, my, like, for example, I want my daughter to be coding in kindergarten. There are Correct. some things that Correct. So does the space look different? Obviously the size looks different based on student population, so on and so forth. But I would say no. My, my response yeah. would be no. I've seen some elementary classrooms just as rich and just as inviting and just as collaborative. Um, I mean, there I would assume safety aspects, but I've seen sure. classrooms at the elementary that look like that. Um, would you say that <clears throat> it might be easier for our younger students to use tablets versus a Chromebook? I would say only maybe at the pre-K, K level, um, because oftentimes when they're at home, they use tablets at mm -hmm, that age. Mm -hmm. You can hand them a phone and, I mean, I've seen, you know, you've seen kids with books trying to do this, right, because right. they're so used to a and tablet. I just wonder, is tablets going to be the way of the future? I coming from ed tech myself, mm -hmm. so I, I think there's a there's a misstatement of the issue in the question, which is not what's easier for the child, but what is appropriate, right? Correct. So my kids already at three and four, they can maneuver the phone, the tablet, I'm trying to get them to get on the keyboard, mm -hmm. and they have to type. So I, you know, <laughs> which sounds weird for a three and a four year old, like, I get that because they're learning. Yeah. But like, I'm trying to get them accustomed to, to that because I don't want um, the tablets for us, and, and especially like as, a, as we're trying to stand up distance learning and post-secondary, they're easy, but then there's a big gap in transition. I mean, this may not be the same for children, obviously, but there's a gap, big gap in transition to getting people accustomed to a computer and a mouse. It's, it's different. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's mm -hmm. not what's expedient for the child based on their natural ability right now, but what do we want to cultivate? Developmentally, right. they may not be ready, but you got to get them to that point. Right. But I, I could see, like, a, we have pre-K 3 and pre-K 4. I do feel that maybe at that yeah, level, sure. you know, considering tablets for them might mm -hmm. be. And we have almost no iPads in the No. Wow. Well, it is an interesting discussion, because if you think about the home life, you're trying Generally speaking, I think there's a slow like regression back away from the traditional computer, a desktop mm -hmm. computer, mm -hmm. to laptops. To now laptops with touch screens, tablets. You know, soon our TVs are going to be touch screen. You know, you get touch screen doorbells. Mm -hmm. So that kind of technology is like infused at home. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, to to that question is, is there a almost a perception of the old school way if when they come to school it's all computers. I don't know, it's just a, a question to throw out there to think about. So definitely look, I, I would say definitely consider different types of devices or what are, explore what are, are the best type of devices for different grade levels. But I would also say outside of the computer, you know, when you're thinking about um, a 21st century classroom, it's not just about technology, right? It's collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, the four C's. So when you think about that, I do think a lot about the space in general. So I'd love to see more than just one whiteboard in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Because when students are developing, when they're creating, when they're designing, you want them to be able, I saw one of your pictures up there where there was a wall uh, mm -hmm. that was a student was writing on and there were a group of students there. So, I mean, I'm thinking of classrooms in the future, I'd love to see. Can you restate those four C's for me, please? I'm totally, I, know, I was in the moment. Uh, yeah, the four, really critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and um, think. I can't think <laughs> right now. They'll come to you. Conscious. Well, I think that is kind of an interesting notion because when um, I think when one thinks about a technology rich environment, like a space, you think like what 
the inside of rack space may look like or something like that. It's, you know, raised floor, there's computers and TVs everywhere, and there's a little bit of, you know, can feel almost cold and impersonal, but what you just described is a very human aspect and a very um, personal relationship that a student has with their teacher, with their peers, mm -hmm. um, even with themselves, and how they begin to develop their own lo logical thinking and decision making. And so it is kind of interesting to talk about that kind of more soft aspect of technology and how it can enhance that as well. We're going to get that for you. I, well, you know I'm looking at But it is. It's introduction of the soft skills together with the technology because those are just as important for students. I love the fact that you mentioned typing because what I will say is um, as a fluke, I needed to fill an elective class in high school. The only class available during my time class was typing. So she said, Communication. Communication. I was right there too. <laughs> so that everything that we put in a child's hands should help enhance those soft skills. When you all develop buildings, do you develop, I think I don't answer this, but do you develop an elementary school? Do you develop a middle school? Or do you develop a building that is modular in a sense that can be added on to and shifted based on need? Hmm. That's a great question. That costs a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question, but it's a very difficult question because on the, from our side, or at least from my standpoint, it's very difficult to predict where we're going to be in 10 years. We try to build buildings that are going to last for a very long time, over 50 years. So I can't see 50 years from now where we're going to be. So we're... I hate to say this, but we're building the building for today, but yet still trying to imagine where we're going to be at least 10 years from now, and where curriculum is going to be in 10 years. Because the curriculum, you know, that's, that's not something that she controls, I think, but it's controlled by the state, and wherever the state goes, we have to follow. To Ruben's point, what we're seeing industry-wide is that districts need buildings that are sound, um, that do have that 50-year age lifespan. But there's a movement towards thinking more about the interior configuration of the building, that it can be changed more in a five to 10-year time span. So what does that mean? Well, your building may be masonry. You, know, you may be using CMU for <coughs> sort of the perimeter. But inside the school, if there's more opportunities to just use metal stud and drywall, something that can be more easily changed, that gives you a little bit of flexibility. Now, the, the ultimate version of that is actual movable walls. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, in the 70s, they had sort of open classrooms. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily a movement the accordion to walls. <laughs> but, yeah, with the accordion <laughs> doors. Because you don't get sound. I mean, there's sound attenuation. There's other issues with that. But some of those ideas of empowering teachers to be able to make those sort of changes are what's coming back. So whether it's on a month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year basis, or you're simply trying to make decisions that can be more easily changed in a five to 10 year time span versus a 50 year time span. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you alluded to that earlier when you talked about the right of the wall and you all I've discussed things like furniture. Right so it's been really really adapting over time. Right so to come. So oh, sure. I know the desks whenever I grew up, the desk that we sat in, you can now see how the desk has transformed over the last oh, yeah. 20, 30 years. So there, there are different ways of addressing and dealing with I guess, educational theory for a district. It really just depends on how you all, what direction you all choose to go in and how you want to teach. I think the other groups are going to be coming back here shortly, but I did want to touch on something. Um, how would you see that the, we talked a lot about the student and how to, and who is, you know, the most important customer, but we also have to consider the teacher. Well, how are we equipping the teacher to be able to deliver that instruction and kind of shape the um, curriculum delivery in the best way possible? Is there anything that you'll want to kind of discuss or share thoughts about um, as far as some of the teachers? Uh, I'll take y'all's lead. 
I'd love to hear. Uh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind is since teachers are teaching face to face and virtually simultaneously, that maybe the um, mobile, the portable, the portable desk, or what is that that you? The height adjustable. Yes, desk for us. So that she could move her, or he or she could move around the room. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking because they've got students in, in two different, you know, spaces mm -hmm. and they need to be able to accommodate. I would just say. Sitting at the desk with, you know, just. Anything that makes the teacher more uh, of a facilitator mm -hmm. that can facilitate learning. So mm -hmm. from the teacher's perspective, and I remember this when I was a teacher, I had um, the program that logged onto my iPad, wasn't that many years ago, <laughs> uh, logged onto my iPad, but that could show, the, um, it was basically the interactive whiteboard on that, my yeah, iPad. Right. So that I wasn't We stuck could do that to, and show it on us so our students could see it also. Yeah, but I wasn't stuck to an interactive whiteboard that's in oh. the corner. So I was able to navigate around the classroom mm -hmm. and it helps with the course behavior and instruction at the same time. And oh, I yeah. can imagine it addresses, just as we talk about students have different learning styles, you know, mobile furniture and transforming you know, stuff. Teachers have different learning styles. Teachers have different learning styles too. <laughs> <laughs> or teaching styles. Yeah. See, yeah. and like that yeah. right there just reminded me, I couldn't do that with a Chromebook. <laughs> that was, I was still a teacher. So that was, you know, several years ago, it was on an iPad and I was There's able to. Yeah, there's an app that allows it to become an interactive whiteboard. I, I can't do that on Chromebook. Okay. <laughs> Bye. We just stay here. Yeah, I know. We have a bunch of students too. Hi. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Well, I'm Devin. I'm Helen. Helen, it's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. I took my allergy meds and dries me out. You can. Oh, I think. It's the board. <laughs> I like it's the board. Okay. <laughs> so I think if you can go and put the tag here, I just want to make sure she can read it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who's the best at this? And Miss David wants a knife man. Oh, okay. You're going to be able to do it. Yeah. Whatever you're going to do, I'm happy to be. So on the end of the we found that the needs are exceeding so far as like water, you know, putting the water, you couldn't support the demand. You want one to one at a time. How do you jump on the cleaner that it could soak in? Um, previously one gig, we did 10. I'm going to scribble and you jump in Thank you. <laughs>
Amanda Garza. I'm a project manager for Fluger. I'm a registered architect and a registered interior designer. And so um, I love K through 12 architecture. Um, my master's thesis was designing a school for children with autism. And um, I think that helped me get my, my first job at Fluger. So, um, you know, we're very passionate about what we do. We specialize in K through 12 facilities. And so um, I'm just excited to be part of the conversation today. I'm really here just to kind of help facilitate and prompt that, but um, the ideas are supposed to come from you all. And then we have Heather Blasey, who's going to be our scribe today and kind of taking notes so that you all can spend time talking and she'll be writing that down. I think the first thing we were asked to do was have a spokesperson who's going to be presenting and reporting back. So I don't know if someone wants to volunteer themselves or receive it. No, no. <laughs> I'll do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So I think that, um, and I think then Helen is going to ask us some questions and then we'll start discussing and we're right. ready to rock and roll. So again, our question is how do we address the technology rich needs of our students? So that, that's I our thought we, were doing we were here. Three. Three. Where are we? Student choice. Okay, never mind. I apologize. That's all right. How do we offer more choice and opportunities to students? And so through the lens of how do we keep uh, moving JISD forward? How do we improve equity within the district and beyond? And how do we continue to ensure that our students are prepared? So the one thing I'll start, mm -hmm. the one thing I always come back to when I think about education today, because of course, when I was in school, it was all classroom. But the one thing for me is um, with so many, the schools have become so competitive, mm -hmm. right? So years ago, you just had the public school system. Everybody went to school. It was just regular classrooms. You go in, it's 24 students per classroom or 22 or 20 or whatever. And it was a very standard classroom setting. Unless you were taking a uh, homemaking class, in which case it was a kitchen, you know, but pretty much other than that, that's really all we had. Today is so much more competitive. We have charter schools. And then of course, all the other school districts in San Antonio, some much larger than us have more money to do, you know, bigger, better things. But I always think, you know, what keeps us competitive? What do we offer? Um, how do we achieve that to keep us competitive with other districts, other charter schools? You know, what do we offer and how do we present that in a way that's very stimulating to students? And um, the one thing that always excited me is when I would walk into school and see a uh, very collaborative space, mm -hmm. you know, an open area, uh, very comfortable furniture, children can come in and it's, it's more about uh, the dialogue and communication, completely different form of teaching than many years ago, <laughs> 35 or 40. So that's what I see today. And so, and it's gonna continue to progress. So when you're trying to project out, what is education gonna look like in five years? What is it gonna look like in 10 years? Because the facilities that we're building, of course, are, here for you know 30 40 years um one of the things and what does that, that look like sorry, that kind of comes to mind when you're talking about that is like our, our libraries having to look different mm -hmm. you know um, our libraries looking different because nowadays i mean a lot of times a hard hands-on book is not used because they they can read it off, you know, whatever device. Their tablet, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever device they you have. Know, so having libraries that, you know, look different. But then, uh, then I think like I go back and I think of the basics in the sense where some of our gyms are still not even air conditioned. And here I am thinking about the library <laughs> and, uh, you know, being in Texas, it's you not hot right now, but you know, in a few months it will be. And then back in August and September, when I don't, we don't have air conditioned gyms that I think it's oh, 107 degrees. Yeah. In there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, um, and I believe that's at elementary and middle school, mm -hmm. correct? 
I mean, obviously the newer schools right. um, would have it, but not potentially the older ones. So that ties into improving equity. Yes. Um, if all of the gyms and all of the facilities had the same. Right. Um, another thing is security. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I see going around to facilities is the newer schools have uh, parking lot lighting. Mm -hmm. And so some of our older schools um, would like, um, probably even Elaw, Fashaw, they don't have parking lot lights. So the teachers like this time of year, they're coming to school and it's in the dark. So they're, because many times they're there at 6.30 in the morning, they get out of the car, they have all their load of stuff that they're taking and it's dark so they don't feel safe. Um, so I've noticed that as well. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's a big thing that I see. Even if they have functions in the evening where parents come and it gets yeah. dark while they're there when they walk out and leave to go to their cars. There's no lighting. You know, one of the things that I don't see at our campuses a lot of is things such as like 3D printers and, you know, things that kids are actually responsible for making themselves, you know, back in the day of sitting in the road and staying still, no one is engaged with that, <laughs> you know, no one like that. So actually having the facilities and the equipment to be conducive to kids making things. Mm -hmm. This, a lot of our si of elementary campuses don't have a true science lab to do the science labs that are required to be done. So I'm trying to think like Crestview, I'm not sure if Crestview or Prashal have true science labs. No, they don't. They don't. You know, and mm -hmm. so one of the things we're doing for Mary and ISD is mm -hmm. putting in a stream lab. So science, technology, reading, art, and math, because mm -hmm. they've been finding that um, literacy needs to be in all aspects. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, you, there, you can read things about science. Mm -hmm. You can do mm -hmm. art projects that relate to science. And so they kind of have this multi-purpose lab that has connection to the outdoor mm -hmm. space. You can do messy projects out there. And so I think it's, that's kind of what you're talking about, that mm -hmm. kind of multi-purpose lab for those fun hands-on projects for students. Well, I some students are very visual. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they learn a lot easier doing visual tasks than reading from a book and it's the comprehension skills, you know? True. And so um, having the ability to have that option for them. I think I think I, I don't come at things from a facilities point of view by, by default, but like, like I rely on the architects to say like, okay, this is how you would make this come to life. But I think like, you know, we don't know what the future holds. And I think we have like a default in education to think like, oh, we need to give them very concrete skills. Like they need to walk out of school with a concrete skill. Like, and I think that's why coding has taken off because it's the one thing we can point to as like, that's a concrete skill that like says future, you know, but actually we can't predict that, you know, especially for as long as these buildings need to last mm -hmm. for our students. And so I think it needs to be like flexibility is mm -hmm. key, Let's like, say, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah that space. like, um, and, and I think like, what is the, the, um, like, what do I want kids to, to feel and experience when they walk into a school? And I think this plays into equity too, because like, you know, I know, I, like having lived in a district, not this one, different one at a different time, but I'm sure it's true here too. Like you walk into an older school and you're like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you walk into a brand new school and it's like, oh my God, this is beautiful. So like I want to be here, you know? And so, and, that's and, not, that and I think that goes back here. to equity yeah. too, mm -hmm. you know, of like, and, and, and I it don't, changes the mm -hmm. student experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really does. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. Um, and those are kind of broad thoughts. And then I think like when I imagine what we need to do as educators to set kids up for the future, we need to give them problem solving skills. It's like critical thinking. It isn't just, 
learn this skill and then you'll be equipped. Like that's going to work for some kids mm -hmm. and, and we want to have that, but then we want to have this, like this stuff that kind of sparks their imagination, it, it pushes them to work together. Um, and yeah. And that takes both like <laughs> training the teachers and, and the, like the facilities to do it. Also, I need to comment that your handwriting looks like the font on blueprints. And it's just like <laughs> fascinating to me. Is that something like you learn in architecture school? Yes, I can attest to that. Yes. I'm just like, wow. It's like the slap on I the just wrist. always thought that was a font. <laughs> like, as I'm writing faster, it gets, it gets a little, yeah. No. That's amazing. Um, I think both of y'all might have mentioned the thing about equity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we look at equity, like for us, I'm always hearing about where the schools on the north side, the schools on the south side of, of Judson. Mm -hmm. But equity that I want my kids here to have just as much of an advantage of what an SAISD mm -hmm. student has. Mm -hmm. You know, north side, Alamo mm -hmm. Heights, mm -hmm. you know. So that type of equity, equity is, you know, important. Not just like, let's say, I'm not saying it is, but let's say Warden Oaks is the, our very best, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, I want Candlewood to have that too, but the equity of even of outside our district, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For since I think maybe six months after I got here, we've been talking about doing the cast school. Mm -hmm. You know, having that is a big mm -hmm. deal to me, having that opportunity mm -hmm. that maybe we even feed it. Ours is a feeder of elementary, middle, and then you get to the high school cast, you know, having those types of things that are really job ready. Mm -hmm. Our kids are job ready, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Not everybody's gonna go to college and that's okay, but they have something as their backup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to the theme of like choice, mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much that like, well, yes, we should offer them lots of choice, right? But it's also that they're ready to leave school to lead choice-filled lives, like it, right? Like they, have been prepared in such a way that there are many options and not just one in front of them. You know, um, if the military is right for them, great. Let's not make it the only option that a kid can do because like they're not prepared to do anything else, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and, and I think too, like, like I love the idea of like specialized high schools like that. I don't love the idea of specialized elementary schools because I think at the younger years, kids should be able to explore a lot of different things to figure out what they love. Okay, and I agree yeah. with that, <laughs> but we're not even giving them those opportunities. Right, yes. Like we don't have robotics at every right. one of our elementary schools. Right. You know how I feel about art. We mm -hmm. don't have art mm -hmm. at every one of our elementaries, mm -hmm. you know, so all those things yes. we really need to expose mm -hmm. our students to because then you know what you like if mm -hmm. you've never had or held an instrument and you know nothing about music you'll you'll say you don't like it right but it's like when you eat vegetables you've never even tried it yeah <laughs> yeah 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 usually by fifth or sixth grade if you ask a child you know what what do you want to be or what do you want to do when you grow up they have some idea they, they can tell you mm -hmm. some kids hit hit it hundred percent and stay with it. Um, I think of it as a path, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we have some programs set up where, you know, um, like you said, they have, like, they want to be a musician. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you need a secondary, you need mm -hmm. something to fall back on mm -hmm. if that doesn't work out. And then they decide, well, you know what? I want to teach philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that path should kind of be designed mm -hmm. to fit them. Just like we have IEPs, for special needs yep. children, I don't know what we would call it, but uh, set that path up for that child. Mm -hmm. And then, because fifth and sixth grade is a good opportunity to ask them, they can tell you, but it gives us enough time that if it should significantly change, by the time they get to the first year of middle school, we can react and adjust mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But with the understanding that, okay, this is it, you're set. And I don't want it to be as dogmatic as it is in Asian countries mm -hmm. where, you, you know, they set you on a white collar, blue collar, or a brown collar path, mm -hmm. and you stay on that. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's kind of regimented too much, mm -hmm. you know, because things change. But mm -hmm. that 
um, pathway would be a great way. Pathway to whatever it is you mm -hmm. want to do. So it sounds like it would be great to have the same programs at all of the elementary schools mm -hmm. and then maybe start having some more magnet programs at the middle Deviations. school and then kind mm -hmm. of the, the feeder into a high school program mm -hmm. that's maybe more career readiness and you have a track of, of electives that you're taking that fit a certain career yeah. choice. That career you and life skills, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I think it's crazy that kids come out of high school and uh, even you, you say, right, well, I know we don't write checks anymore, but, <laughs> but balance um, a you know, balance your, balance your account, <laughs> can't um, do it. Uh, know how to read a water bill, understand that doggone cell phone bill mm -hmm. that you run up every month with these games and stuff. Um, we'll never, ever understand Bitcoin, so we won't touch that. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's a lot of opportunity by the time they get to mm -hmm. high school to, to kind of help with that. I know um, um, and a good example of what, where my mindset goes is uh, Boysville, you know, and the fact that, you know, you turn 18 today and tomorrow you got to pack your bags and go, mm -hmm. you know, really, you know, if you know very many, mm -hmm. I mean, think about yourself at 18, were you ready to just walk out the door and mm -hmm. go get an apartment and a car and a house and, a, you know, everything you need. And, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> if we, part of the path includes that life mm -hmm. skills portion mm -hmm. where they can, uh, you know, figure that out mm -hmm. or understand that, you know, just because you get married at 18, 19, 20, you can put off having a family for, you know, plan it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. stop having all these surprises. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, if you all can wrap up in about another minute or so and head back on into okay. the boardroom, then we'll be ready for all three groups to be able to share. Okay. Okay. Thanks. My last so, thought on um, early elementary is like play based, like mm -hmm. spaces for play yes. and like outdoor classrooms. Um, Pre-K for SA has amazing facilities yes, they for do. little kids. Mm -hmm. well, what other programs or facilities have you seen in some of those surrounding districts that you would like to see at Judson? Cast Tech has an amazing building. I love mm -hmm. theirs. Um, the buildings should be designed so that they are versatile. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, like you you brought up the point of, you know, you walk in an old one. Mm -hmm. Some people come back and go, wow, they haven't changed this since I was mm -hmm. here. And they're 60 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, the buildings should be built in a way that they're versatile yeah. and, and can can um, be re design even mm -hmm. even if it's a matter of moving floating walls, mm -hmm. uh, it comes to mind because at the Academy of Health Sciences, that's the way our whole third floor is designed mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. to accommodate um like this this um um training cycle there may be more lab techs going through than uh, uh animal trainers versus food inspectors mm -hmm. and so the walls are designed so that we can flip those walls around and accommodate that number of soldiers and if you don't need that many this time you cut it off and give it to mm -hmm. the tangos who take care of veterinary specialists and stuff so that way you can do that and make upgrades as needed. Or in a case like COVID, we'd be able to move walls and be able to give the students the space they need to have that six mm -hmm. foot difference instead of panicking and almost needing to build a whole new building just to accommodate the number of students. Yeah. Most of the schools I've been in otherwise have been like retrofitted old buildings. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, they do what they can. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we do have limitations mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. But we money. Can't, money is also mm -hmm. always an obstacle. But you can go into existing buildings and you can uh, create interactive mm -hmm. spaces yeah. and larger spaces yeah. by taking out some walls or whatever the case may be. So that can be accomplished, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed with our IT here at Justin because we uh, Dr. Ball and her staff got right on mm -hmm. making sure that our students had what they needed yes, for this situation but it, um, this part is not our fault but I, I was disappointed that more of the churches didn't say you know what we'll turn on our hot spots mm -hmm. you know and maybe right. that would have helped with some of the areas where we were having students having to do stuff like go sit in Walmart parking lot and mm -hmm. all that just to get homework mm -hmm. done, you know? Right. Um, 
it, it would have been nice. But then again, that's something that, you know, where we have to team up with uh -huh. them ahead of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Carson, I have to wrap up. Um, we're working with uh, District Commander and XD, and one of the things that they're considering is um, having a school that offers that virtual component just mm -hmm. because of what we've had to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. And there are some kids who maybe they have to work to support their families and things like that. And so they're, they're looking at offering that mm -hmm. in the future. It's like, mm -hmm. if you want to just go virtual for high school, you can do that. Kind of well, I do think with COVID, I do think with COVID and the fact that people know they can uh, get a good education virtually, that there are some people, I don't know if we'll ever see 100% of our students back. And I think we need to pay really close attention to that because I do think there's a fair amount of them. They're going to work from home. Yeah. You know, it gives them flexibility. Right, and a less rigid schedule, and you're right, if they need to work, if they're caring for somebody in their family or brothers and sisters or whatever the case may be, but there's a lot of different reasons mm -hmm. for that. But and in that case, I, we absolutely have, have to discipline. plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Michael, you haven't shared anything. <laughs> I'm listening to this wonderful conversation. So um, the opportunities uh, for students, uh, I think the key, like, like both of you all said, is flexibility. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, 33% of the cars are going to be driving themselves. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years from now, evaluations in school are going to be completely different. Mm -hmm. Universities are already going away from, I sit there by myself and solve problems mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. nowhere in any realm, whether it's career, college, military, the days of taking a test by yourself are done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I think what is paramount here is it sounds like we're all agreeing that a new shiny rectangle with new furniture is not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm, right. We're looking for versatility to be able to do that, to be able to try to anticipate. I, now, I said 10 years from now, we're going to be doing this, I'm guessing, like anybody else. Exactly. But we, we do know it's going to look way different than what it looks now. Right. Uh, and so we have to prepare for that as best as possible. And so I agree that the flexibility to be able to be versatile is going to be important, but it still needs to take a break away, breath mm -hmm. away when you walk in mm -hmm. and say, this is where I want to be mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and look at this space. So. And we have to uh, figure out a way to, um, I know we're pretty good at it at Judson, but appealing to parents, mm -hmm. you, you know, because that I, I watched this lady stand in Walmart and get all excited because, you know, we have yet another one of these schools getting ready to open up and mm -hmm. she's standing there reading the, the card. But what struck me more than anything is the enthusiasm of that teacher or, mm -hmm. or administrator that was selling it. She was selling it. Mm -hmm. If that woman had never thought about moving her kid to a charter school, mm -hmm. by the time she walked away from that table, it was on her mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I stood there and off. And I'm like, I'm on the Jetson school board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know? So yeah, they, they're selling it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and that, that's one of the questions I asked when I got here. What are they doing that we're not doing, you know? They're like, selling it, but the thing mm -hmm. is, a lot of times when they get in there, they find out the shiny mm -hmm. new coin mm -hmm. is not the shiny new coin. That is true. So, You're yeah, right. and we, we end up keep getting them, from, them back. We have to keep them from going anywhere. That's mm -hmm. the that's plan. That's the key. That has, the we plan. have to keep them here. What we offer needs to draw them in and, want, and them want to stay. Right. you know and not just for the sports but it is a marketing <laughs> thing i mean unfortunately school districts have now become a business like no other oh, you know goodness. they have to market what they provide just as much as a a uh, independent business does and you know who can help us with our marketing the real estate companies that Definitely. surround us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I tell you, I you know, as an agent, you get calls all the time. Mm -hmm. What's the best school district? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, true. I want my son or my daughter to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we get them, hey, add Judson to your little flyer. Mm -hmm. You know, so your we'll agent is no, this is what that, we that offer. Somebody called me about that this weekend and I didn't call her back. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. just one other little thing real quick. You know, even our new schools that we built, we didn't build them with smart boards in mind mm -hmm. you know i i don't see a lot of smart boards mm -hmm. in in our campuses all the creative technology ways to engage students we haven't done that we continue to buy the same 
old looky type furniture mm -hmm. instead of getting something that's new and different, you know? So in all these schools, we should be buying furniture that looks different. You know, have y'all seen those things that are moving around all the time? The kids, I don't know what they're called, but you know, it's like, like a ball. Or oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I seats. use one for wiggle my desk. Yeah. Yes, yeah. wiggle seats. Yeah. You well, know, all those things we should be doing so our place looks different and inviting. So I think that's what a lot of parents want. They want something different for their child so they can feel, hey, my my child is getting like a private style education in a public, in a public school. In a public school. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it should be. Well, think about, I mean, people love the Google headquarters, right? Yes. Because of the flexibility mm -hmm. of the furniture and the connectivity with it. And you can learn in different environments or, or collaborate in different environments. And that's really what our schools as mm -hmm. marketing tools, I mean, these are all things that allow you to do that. I do think we need to go back. That yes. clock oh, is stopped, yeah. so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that means time's up. Clocks that work are yes. <laughs> but you know, there's those digital But so many ones. of them have gone away from yeah. clocks. Yeah. They don't digital well, because kids can't even use those. Then, you know, if it's not a digital comic, a lot of kids have time. I'm right. supposed to be scary. Or make change. Oh, good. Do I get to make a um, Okay, now you're recording. Yeah, you're too much. <laughs> like, am I touching your heart? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You're not in it. You can focus at that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll move around. Uh, we're all set. Please, please. No, no, after you. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to put over? Okay. Um, so are you going to start us? You want me yeah. to get in and kick it off? Or, but our group is uh, creating environments, supporting college and career readiness. And um, you're not here on accident. We know that you work in counseling. We know that you have more experience than anybody on the board in education. So, um, and Ms. Uh, Robinson is responsible for that particular area. So we really wanted to bring you guys in and say, hey, what is it that we could do more? Is it is it more project based learning in those type of environments that we need to concentrate on? Um, are we really training our students with the types of libraries that we currently have? 
versus where they're going because they're not going to a campus with a bunch of old books in it and it smells like you know they go in and just you know get on stuff and and do we have the uh broadband structure on campus for a kid to be able to surf in the middle of the cafeteria and, and do some studying and stuff like that so you got it yeah. uh, I'm Lindsay. I'll be your scribe, holding all of our good ideas. And then, does anybody, I guess, want to be the presenter back to the to the group? Once we oh no, I, I I think I've talked more than my share today. <laughs> you, you got Miss oh, King. Miss King. <laughs> <laughs> but Miss uh, Miss Kenora talks all the time. As long as you have everything. We'll we'll there you go. We'll, we'll yeah. for you. A leadership role going there, girl. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so Lindsay will sculpt, and I, my name is Christian Owens again, and I'm just going to help kind of feed some thought based on kind of what y'all are thinking, and uh, I think based on yeah, mm -hmm. any, any ideas around that. And, and actually, we started the conversation today because there was a, a facilities uh, committee meeting and so I was brought in just for the short piece of the libraries and so um, ELOC, uh, one of our elementaries is actually going to become a STEAM uh, campus mm -hmm. and so we were able to get a grant and get to Trinity and so that's how we've been able to to start this journey of uh, turning that campus into a STEAM campus and so um, as we're looking at the facilities we were looking at the library because that happens to be one of the of the pieces of the building that's being redone and so, um, so, so Scott, uh, Scott Wilson, who was the principal, you know, he ordered the traditional library furniture. And so kind of when it landed by my desk, I was like, oh, no, we're not doing this. Oh, we're right. going into STEAM. Mm -hmm. We have to think STEAM. And right. so, uh, so when I came into the meeting this, uh, this afternoon, one of the things I was telling them, I said, look, we need to think about the 3D printers, you know, as yeah. far as technology mm -hmm. is concerned. We need to think about module uh furniture that you can move around you need flexible. to yeah like, you need flexible things large group small group it, individual work yeah, exactly whatever. you need to be able to have uh be able to move things around within within that space um it's not a library library per se it's yeah. more of a a collaboratory yeah, yeah. Collaboratory. it's a resource center they call it like a maker, a maker space it's a maker space and so one of the things that i was telling them i said look uh i'm you know I love that the idea of books. You know, we can't get rid of not having paper right. books because kids need to know this is a book, these are mm -hmm. papers, and this is how you read a book. This is a Dewey Decimal exactly. System. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never see it again, but this is it. <laughs> but, but I was telling you, I said, in, all, yeah. in all honesty, I said, how are kids checking out our books right now? It's online. Yeah. Yes. Right now, it's online. Yes. Our kids, because a lot of our kids are virtual learners, you're providing those services online. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the books are just sitting there. Yeah. The kids that are coming in to do face to face, yes, they are able to get the books. But the kids that are online, they check out books through through technology. Well, and they, I think some campuses have a pickup time where kids can reserve a book through the, exactly. the library oh, system yeah. and then they can come by and pick it up and then it's quarantined once they bring it back. Exactly. So once they bring it back, then, you know, we can either wipe it off and we put it back on the shelf, that kind of stuff. But but the idea of the room has to change, you know? Yes. Um, and I can tell you just, um, you know, and, and I'm looking at equity versus equality. Right. So exactly. I, I, to me, that's the way I look at things. And so when I walk into where the most, I'm like, oh my God, look at this beautiful school and look at all the science, the science equipment that's the in Kiva, here, that you know, that, that area, mm -hmm. the gathering area that they have. And then I walk over to the shawl and I don't have a science room. Yes, I don't have the key areas. And so the older buildings, and it's not because it's a north side or a south side, it's not that. It's just they were built. old versus that's new, and that's what it is. And so to me, I'm looking at, at, at equity as far as, okay, look at our old buildings that we have, and where's the equity? And so to me, it's we need to think about how can we possibly move our buildings so that all kids mm -hmm. have the same equal opportunities within our buildings, knowing that we have some, some age buildings. And so uh, we need to think about 
those particular things because uh, technology is it. I mean, I turned over about when I heard about the gaming, I was like, hey, yeah. 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 It's, it's I a great tool that we can share. I turned over to Ceci and I was like, okay, yeah. 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 we need yeah. to talk about this, you time. know? <laughs> Yeah. And, and as far as that goes, you know, we know that the, the, the future of the world is technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is it we need to do to update our infrastructure technology wise? What is it we need to do to update our appliances that students are using? Um, we bought a whole bunch of Chromebooks, but we know that doesn't last forever. So that's something. And, you know, that's not something we can pull out of the budget every year to, right. and, to and, buy new and, new and I can tell you, you know, we uh, we actually started three different groups. We started mm -hmm. the teacher perspective groups, and so I want we needed to have feedback about what's working, what's not working, uh, and what are possible solutions. Mm -hmm. So, so we have an elementary group, a middle mm -hmm. group, and a high school group. And so, you know, the high school group is telling us, hey, the Chromebooks aren't working for us because we're using very right. complicated apps, and, and they don't have know, the memory, and, and, and they don't have what it takes it. in order for us to do it. And so. Right now I have I have my CTE director, okay, what is it, where are we missing? What do we do that we need to buy so that we can address those particular needs for next year? And we're gonna go buy Chromebooks. Well, I don't need to buy all Chromebooks. I need to buy a chunk of actual, actual laptops. I, I'd even say this, you know. when we purchase buses, we don't do a bond and say, hey, give me $3 million and I'm gonna go buy 30 buses. Right. We say, give me $3 million, and then the first year we're going to buy 10 buses, and then three years from now we're going to buy another 10, mm -hmm. but it's programmed right. in over a period of time. Maybe that's something that we need to do in terms of technology or start exactly. considering. Like because, a replacement. Yeah. Because in all, in, all, in all honesty, uh, you know, right. a laptop is going to be as good as three years, Bingo. five years. And then you're, then you're really, you're, re you're reaching right. <laughs> at five years. And so... Uh, so teachers are telling us they need to be able to really use the apps. They need, you know, some of them are asking us for dual monitors, mm -hmm. you know, because they feel like I need to be able to yes. to see know, what my kids are seeing and teach. And, teach. and I'm just like, okay, I don't, okay, all right, uh, let me see how I can convince Bill. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, those are the things that teachers are telling us. And so, um, it, you well, know, we think we know that virtual learning isn't going to go away. We've opened that door, correct? And now um, we need to be able to to provide for that. So if we're doing that, then the teachers need to have the tools that they need in order to be effective instructors that way exactly. and the dual monitors absolutely i know uh, i have a lot of teacher friends who went out and bought a second monitor there uh, themselves mm -hmm. um so that they could actually do that or i have people who are signing in on an ipad and so they can see what the students are seeing and and doing it that way and we shouldn't be asking our teachers to do that to mm -hmm. do their job absolutely so and, and i can tell you that um, when i was assistant superintendent somewhere else and we got all that chunk of money remember mm -hmm. they gave us a chunk mm -hmm. of money but one of the things that we did was we did what we call the smart classroom. And so yeah. We, yeah. we did the in focus uh -huh. projector. I, I was able to bring in speakers, yeah. built in speakers into uh -huh. the room. And that's what teachers are asking for right now. Uh -huh. The built in speakers. Yes, they be able because to the kids can't the hear wall. with the masks and everything. Yeah. And they the, want, they want yeah. to be able to move around, right. but, but you're you have you're tied to hand yeah. right here mm -hmm. because you don't have that sound system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they're asking me, hey, can you buy movable cameras? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, uh, yeah, that was kind of high on the budget. When we looked at those. <laughs> <laughs> Bill was like, I don't know about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Nice move. And so, and so, so we need to think about purchasing those kinds of things where we make it easier for the teacher so that I don't have to bring down the projector. The project, it's a button. It's a you know, I don't have to turn on the thing. I, I touch a button for it. So we need to automize. And that was one thing that they asked us to automize as much as possible. And voice amplifiers. And, voice, and yes, you know, exactly. So those are the things thing. that we really need to think about when we make our new buildings. We can't build them like we used to build them. What, um, what about, what else do you see at the college level that we really haven't incorporated K through 12? maybe like a, a big large group instruction room or I, I don't know. Yeah, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is you need the big instructional rooms and that's kind of what colleges are doing. They, and the they have the modular, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. And they, it, they move things around, they, they have those portable walls and they, they move around. I don't I know if you cool. saw, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now the walls actually become a place where you write. Got it. And so oh. you need to be able to, you know, no longer is it, I'm gonna have a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. I need to use my walls. So right mm -hmm. on, no right. matter where it is that I am. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be able to to have those um, that movable from you know mm -hmm. uh, 
kind of like what we have over here at the at the new building at the that we just purchased at, at oh the, right mm -hmm. that you have those, those modular those furniture. modular mm -hmm. furniture okay that's what we need to see you teachers really need to have that power of writing wherever it is that they need to write not just i have to write on that wall because that's the only wall i can write on because mm -hmm. that's so white wood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and then everyone has to be oriented Maybe that way that and then now you've got your old traditional sitting right. rows and right. got it. One thing that you all talked about in the introduction was um, about, and I know that has to do with student choice, but I want to refer to it because I think we've done a really good job with our career pathways. Um, but I think that we need to go back and reevaluate, are those career pathways totally equipped for the students' learning needs? So for example, we have the cosmetology lab in place already at Veterans. Mm -hmm. We have a print shop in place at Veterans. Mm -hmm. We have our dental program. Yeah. Do they have, do they have the mock-up? Because I don't know. Uh -huh. I see Do they have saying. those kinds yes. of things to fully immerse right. the students? No, so don't. that they so this is right. something that we need to look at then mm -hmm. um, as an equitable program. Yes. If we have that for these, mm -hmm. shouldn't we also be looking at I know automotive, yeah. we have the shops, welding, they right. have that kind of thing, and in, in our, our well, STEM academies they at. have tools, but but yeah. does every program have that? Yeah. What about our ag barn? Is that is that yeah. up to date? Is that ready to go for right. what, what they need, need there? Need so to. we need to do some kind of study and evaluation yeah. of all those programs to make sure that, you know, if we're looking at this and we're compiling a wish list and, and what, what we think to, is going to help make our students prepared for college and career, um, these career programs that we have in place um, that if they emerge with a certificate, it should really be a true reflection that they're ready to enter that job market. And if they haven't actually had a dentist chair and, mm. uh, and all that equipment, a laboratory exactly, yeah. exactly. A if they like haven't tools. actually had that, yep. then we're not really truly sending That's, them out ready yeah. to go to be dental yeah. hygienists. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we do as much as we can with what we have, but but you know, let's think big here. Yep. So that that's yeah. something I'd like to see as an evaluation of our facilities. You know, if, where we are and, with and that. I'm sure you've done this, but you know, what are the business partners right, right to help tell you that? Right. right. Like, what is it that you need our students to help enforce that work uh, mm -hmm. population? Mm -hmm. So. You know, I think there's some alliances and some partnerships. That exactly. Have and we, we have a few of those, yeah. but we can always do better. Well, like aviation. Right. 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 You're in the world of aviation right here. Right. I mean, so. And then that's the other labs, thing. And I know right. that's a student choice part of it. Yeah. But but are we going to also look at more pathways for our students? Right. No, you know, no, what no. is it that we're missing on? I think that falls right. into this about being career ready right. and call it supporting that as yeah. far as how can we make sure that we do provide everything that they would need to be able to be completely ready. I would like it to see us have a fine arts pathway yes. with with a fine Thank arts you. high school I would like us to see it have a cast high school mm -hmm. and you know and maybe there's school within a school you yeah. know programs here and not brand new buildings or maybe some of some of what we've purchased we could use mm -hmm. for some of that um so you know it, it may be that we reconfigure the whole district right. <laughs> in terms of maybe one of the middle schools yeah. becomes you know, exactly. a cast exactly. school, exactly. and maybe it's yeah. middle and high school there. Does that exist now? Yeah. Uh, you, you brought up a great point. You know, does that exist now that they're able to choose their pathway? Well, for high school, yes, for high school. Like, absolutely. Like, and it, and we bust them wherever that is they choose to go. Ninth grade. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. But well, we except really... for J STEM, which starts <clears throat> at, at middle right. school. But but should we be looking at? But that's the only middle school, really. Exactly. Right. But should we be looking at a fine arts <laughs> academy yeah. that is? Six twelve. Yeah, it's more discovery, right? Yeah. And so you know, so are we? That's something that I would like to that that this committee and, to look at. Yeah. Not, and actually, yeah. you know, trying to teach uh, music at in, in the middle school, trying to teach a child how to play mm -hmm. a an instrument virtually has been extremely difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it, we just don't have. I mean, kids have got to come and. You know, it's just if we build right. this school where kids can come together and truly, you know, focus on their music because we have some, I mean, some right. great programs. Well, not just music, drama. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Mark. Athletics. Look at all that. You can't learn how to block on television. <laughs> so, so is so is that something then that that absolutely? You know, I. Um, we need to think more a desperate need for a, a, another middle school. I totally desperate agree. need. I, I'm I'm the representative for District One, which is where which all of my areas go to Kitty Hawk right now. And I have had 
um, more than one request from parents of the northern end out by Wortham Oaks because those kids go from all the way out there, way Evans past, Road, right, from Evans Road and Bulverde all the way down to Kitty Hawk for middle school. And it's not just the distance for them, but it's also the 1,400 kids there. Correct. I didn't you know, realize it was that. Big. It's always been the biggest. It's, it's that always is, been. That's huge. It's a and, but it was 1,200 and it keeps it keeps getting bigger. So, you know, so that's something that's that's needed. So, you know, if if we if we do add another middle school, then that frees up space to maybe do some things that are a little different. Right. Right. I think I want to wrap up about two minutes or so. Okay. Right. Yeah. I was about to okay. ask wrap up this thread. Mm -hmm. Do you think if another middle school is a thing, you have the opportunity to adjust another existing campus? Exactly. To become that. that um, so maybe that becomes one of those, like because it's centrally, it's fairly centrally true. located. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we always want to think. As I heard the introduction, it triggered me to think about the competition, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't even want to say their name. Yeah. But they always get to hear that the middle school students come back to us. Mm -hmm. and we need to get that middle school ready mm -hmm. for what, what those kids exactly. are, why those kids left, right? They come back to this. So. Exactly. I think that I think the concept over at Jetson Middle School yeah. is going to be kind of the way we go with things, meaning that it's going to be difficult to turn a whole middle school campus into something. A school within a school mm -hmm. is capable yeah. at all the middle schools throughout the district. Mm -hmm. So you can take mm -hmm. some of something and put it that like JSTEM and make it a specialty. Perfect. But if we're saying we're going to make all of Jetson Middle the STEM middle school, that's when it creates more of a uh, a hardship. For and it's hard, yeah, it's, uh, I was thinking that it would be harder. Yeah, mm -hmm. a school with Dennis will probably be the easiest thing. Definitely. And maybe we have multiple. Maybe we have we have STEM North End and South End. Exactly. And exactly. you know, because exactly. because the one thing I don't want is for students at the South End to feel like they don't yeah. have the same opportunities as students at the North End. Or I got to get on a bus and go over there. And, and, and travel for 30 minutes to get to wherever it is I'm going. So that. we all, you know, the shape of our district temper is a lot, you know, we have this yeah. long skinny jack. Right. And so, you know, right. so how do you do those things? So yeah. equity yeah. always is a huge yeah. issue for yeah, us. That, that, yeah, that's, uh, would you, I think you were kind of wrapping up on the most important thing at the end of the day. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I mentioned one other thing when you're talking about career writing. Right. Stuff is what are the skill sets yes. mm -hmm. for these kids? And that does start to allude to what you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of collaborative areas, right? These are all things we work in, just like we're modeling right now. Right. So we're no longer working in silos to come up with um, solutions for challenges. So that would start to spill into your elementary exactly. all the way up. Well, you, you start those skills there. Yeah. And then you continue to grow them as they And that's, as they that's getting you ready for the right. world that we're all in. Yeah, exactly. So looking at so, the spaces we have, are they at every elementary? Are they, are they facilitating that? Right. Thinking. So the library is mm -hmm. one of the biggest ones. It's all about right. books, right? Well, not necessarily anymore. And does the library need to be a destination? Mm -hmm. Not really. I think so. But some of that can start to be pulled into mm -hmm. easy access of where your classrooms are, your neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So it's redefining even what a library is, right? right? Their facility. Exactly. Well, you so know, we kind of made the knowledge. shift from library to library media specialist. Right. But but is there a, an even more further transfer? Sure. Facilitators of knowledge, Perfect. you know? Perfect. So anyway, <laughs> we need more time. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. This is going really fast. Uh, and, and I look at our some of the businesses, you know, our, you know, Amazon. I mean, you look at Amazon, oh, yeah. and, and yet we're not preparing our kids mm -hmm. to move into that particular field and so um and we need to that's it. every we job you go into you have to talk with someone to figure out a problem or mm -hmm. come up with a solution mm -hmm. so how are we encouraging that well and the key can't be let's talk to someone and say what are you guys doing right now the key has to be right. in the future right. yeah. because years. if we start building for what they're doing now by the time we build it yeah. it's outdated yeah but if we start building for what they project is going to come, then we're right in the groove yep. and it's time to start training. Right. So, um, uh, you want me to turn it off? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great conversation.
is set up to where whomever speaks could stand by their uh, printouts and then be able to speak from there. Okay. So, so the idea is we have the notes that we're taking from each of our groups. You can use those in common um, to be able to share how your impression went. Here's why these notes are going to be important. Uh, at each of your seats, there's a sheet of colored dots that I put down. And uh, I folded it so that uh, on top are just the six red dots. As you listen to the conversation from your group and from the other two groups, what we'll ask you all to do, the, the, ask the board to do specifically, is to think about what you hear, and then after hearing from all three groups, use those six dots to identify the things that you think are priorities from all of the discussions. Test? Okay. <laughs> use those dots. <laughs> <laughs> to, to identify the priorities. What your work here tonight will do is help set the charge for the Growth and Planning Committee. So that committee is going to be looking in more detail at facilities, at your existing schools, at future schools or future facilities. And we want them to be able to do that with the, look at that through the lens, if you will, of the thinking and the dialogue and discussion that you all have had tonight. When you have your dots, you are free to put them onto six different items. If there's any particular item that you think is particularly important as a priority, you could put multiple dots on one item. That's totally fine, it's your call. But that's, that's how we'll wrap up tonight, basically. That's our last step, as we hear from each of your three conversations and um, get that kind of feedback that way from each of you. So if it's all right, Mr. Diaz, we could start with you in group one, if you're okay with that. Terrible <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so, um, so we had the technology group, and Robin and Desmond are gonna help me out at some point. Um, <clears throat> so the, the question we're trying to answer is, it's kind of twofold. So what is the infrastructure, the technological infrastructure needed in order to power the learning and the delivery of education in a way that is flexible, efficient, and forward-thinking. Right, and there's kind of two sides of the house to that. There's obviously the, the IT itself, so devices, what do those devices look like, where are they, what type of devices are appropriate for what level. I will say that it, this will also feed into the conversation about choice, and about our programming, so it's important to keep that in mind. And then secondly, what does the actual space look like and how is it built out to ensure uh, both student engagement, but both teacher, I don't wanna say engagement, because they're engaged with teacher delivery and optimizing how they, how they deliver and ensure that we can provide a flexible space for the teacher to give direct instruction, but then break off, right? And none of the groups, none of the, the working groups feel like they're being left out or not have the adequate space to do whatever they're performing. The educators in the room know exactly what that means. Um, for me, as like, a, I'll put myself in the dad position. So if my child goes into the classroom, is getting direct instruction, and then is placed in their individualized learning plan to do whatever task they're assigned to do. How is my child comfortable? Does my child have everything that they need in order to stay engaged in a positive atmosphere where they will continue to, to feel like they're part of the, of the collective class? Um, and then allow the teacher the flexibility to move around adequately. And then when you converge again, and Ceci made a great point, is how is a teacher empowered to be able to deliver on the four critical C's, which I learned this evening, um, to ensure that the teacher not, not feel like they're being shortchanged or having to make a square peg fit in the round hole. Um, so those are the questions we're trying to answer. And obviously, you know, ensuring, and, and this will all dovetail into the other parts of the conversation, but ensuring that we have flexibility, that we're thinking not about the immediate needs of today, but thinking about what will be the norm in 10 years from now, that way we adequately plan. Um, and it looks like, it sounds like, 
it's te technology rich, flexible spaces where regardless of the curriculum that's being given, the space will give, will allow for maximum learning and teaching to take place. I'm not quite sure if I captured it all, but you know, that's, and I, and I think that's a critical, it is not the critical piece, but it is a critical piece because it is the, the backdrop for the conversation about programming and choice and how do we make sure that regardless of the campus or the curriculum or the program that we're gonna deploy at that campus, it is flexible and allows for it. That way we don't pigeonhole a campus. And especially when we talk about equity, that way no part of the district feels like they're left out. Everybody has the ability to have the same wonderful experience and nobody feels like I got the seconds, you know, this, you know, the, the program was set here because of the limitations. We don't want the current limitations to, to bound our creativity and the, and the vision that we have for every campus to be the same, yet have its distinct identity. So I'll stop there. And Ms. Madam President, if you wanna add anything, of course. I think you, I, I think you pretty much summarized what we were talking about, don't you think, Ms. Davis? We, yeah, we, we, we talked about are we, do, is it a concern for us to think about how we are meeting the needs of students right now or is it a concern? Is it a concern that we are talking about the needs of our students 10 years from now? Do our buildings need to all look the same? Do all ele elementary campuses need to look the same? And if they don't, what do they, is, what do they need to look like in, in, in order to address the rich technology? But he summarized it very well. <laughs> What's tomorrow? <laughs> or gala? Now, and, and then just something else that, that Madam President brought up, which is, and I don't want it to be misconstrued, like looking the same in, our, in the Judson vision isn't cheapening, right? It's making sure that they're all rich. Yes. Um, so I think that's important. Like we don't want them to look the same in a, which is usually has a negative connotation of bland, but uh, a creative space where student and teacher can take agency mm -hmm. over that program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the cast. Thank you. So I'd like to move on to uh, the second group, uh, Ms. King, if you want to share a little bit about what uh, you all talked about in terms of college and career readiness. Yeah, so we talk about basically meeting the needs of our students to prepare them for college and also any type of um, career pathway that they may have. And so um, we talked about um, the importance of making sure that there, um, that there was teacher feedback and what they needed to teach the students. Um, in regards to what is inside the classroom. And so, um, you know, there were some examples that were given out, such as, you know, dual monitors, um, cameras, you know, um, um, the setup of their classroom. Also making sure that um, they had the labs in there um, so that the students were able to um, have that atmosphere that they would have in a college setting to prepare them for whatever uh, career that they may have, certification. Um, we also talked about um, making sure that, um, that, that we looked in research regarding those needs because everything changes in regards to, like you said, the technology. The technology changes um, each year and also the way that things are set up, um, what is important in regards to careers, careers change as well. Um, we talked about Let's see here, making sure that we talk with business partners in regards mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. needs um, for career technology, making sure that we knew what those important careers were and um, how we can get those set up in our uh, school. Um, also the pathways. And so we looked at how we would have different pathways at the school, um, you know, instead of having 
um, a large school that was just a specific magnet school, maybe a school within a school um, would be, you know, um, beneficial. And also making sure that our children um, had access um, to these different programs, that there was equity um, so that there was an, a lot of travel. We didn't want students to have to travel really far to um, the different campuses. So making sure that um, there was, uh, I guess, a centered um, building or campus where you know there were different pathways offered where children were able to to access. And so making sure pretty much that things were um, available for them. And we know that there's you know different priorities that we need to make, um, but there has to be a plan. What is the um, the most important though? What do we need to look at first? What um, looking at what is in the long range though? Um, did I get everything? Can I just say that one of the things that we looked at was flexibility. Um, in terms of what it is we're, we're going to want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we can't ask for everything all at once. So there needs to be a long range plan. And what is the priority that we, that we bring forward? Um, we talked about flexibility in terms of, as Ms. King was saying, um, maybe at certain middle schools, we incorporate some of these ideas. I, I particularly think that um, we have shortchanged the arts programs. So is there a, a 612 arts program that we could put in place? Is there a way to do maybe a 3-8 program where we have some students at some of the middle schools? How are we going, could, could we rearrange where we place students to facilitate adding programs that way? And so that, that takes some thinking there. And then making sure that all our facil facilities are up to date for the career, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the pathways we have in place. We don't have a true dental lab. So we're sending students out, we're sending people out with a uh, certification where they haven't really actually implemented what they were trained for. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we talk to our teachers and that we have, I have some water, that we talk to our teachers and make sure that they have what they need to sh truly equip our students. Um, and then the equity piece is so important. We want to make sure that every student has the opportunity. So if we're looking at installing new programs somewhere, can we do a north end and a south end version? Mm -hmm. Can we do, what is it that we do to make sure that every student has access? Yes, dream big. So if, if this is what we want for our students, it may take us 20 years to accomplish it, um, but that doesn't mean we should eliminate it from the conversation. So maybe we have to baby step. So in this, this particular point in time, this is what we can do. But letting the, the, the public know that this other part is coming and that we haven't forgotten about all these other pieces. So com the communication of what it is that we want to do, I think, is really important. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to turn to group three. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, do you want to share about um, choice yeah. and opportunity? Yeah, so so many of the themes that other groups have already talked about came up in our group as well. So um, flexibility was a, a key word, like planning for the future and what careers will look like in the future. Um, I think the one thing that I would add that hasn't come up as much regarding our topic, which was student choice, was how do we make um, the space and the options within it really attractive for students and families. Um, and uh, that can happen in a lot of ways, but like you should walk into the building and want to be there and want to learn. Um, and that is uh, a big factor. Um, and yeah, I think, I don't know that, uh, was there anything else that, uh, that, I'm, <laughs> that didn't come up already? I don't want to be super repetitive, but yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the conversation that each of you had. Um, we really only, uh, at this point, our, our intent is just to let them, let you all um, kind of look at what's written, be sure you can identify how you'd want to prioritize anything. Um, we really only have one more sort of uh, slide to present in terms of next steps. Dr. Ball, did you want to say something? 
I just, I, I think I, I heard it said in different ways and everything. And I think that what's very important for me also with this is about the equity and the equity, not just within our district. A lot of times us as senior staff, we're talking about making sure that the north side schools, south side schools, that everybody has kind of the same and then no one feels like one has more than the other, but also equity outside of our district, making sure that what our students have is just as good or better than any other school district. So that type of looking at that type of equity lens is, is very important to us. And I have a question and didn't bring it up in our group or anything, but I have a question and I'd like to know where this fits. Mm -hmm. um, where does it fit? <laughs> and this is something that Ruben and Dr. Fields have heard me say before. <laughs> where does it fit where, when you decide the sustainable type materials that you use to build a school? Where does that fit in this conversation or does it? Well, I think, I mean, I don't know how you all have talked about it before. My thought is that that fits with the idea of how things get implemented. And this conversation tonight is more about what needs to be implemented. So that's more on the how. How do you want things to come about? I, I, don't. I, I would only say to, to your point, Ms. Bashaw, that um, we're not saying that we're not saying bond. We're just saying that we need to determine how we can go about accomplishing all of the excellent ideas that you guys brought up tonight. What you're asking is when we go forward with accomplishing some of those ideas, what material we're going to use to make that happen when is that going to be considered in terms of what it's going to take to make it happen? I understand that. Um, uh, that would be when we come back, hopefully this committee bursts, hey, we think that you guys should do this. We think that you guys should do that based on what you told us the, the interest were. Then when we bring that back, that's when we would have the conversation of, okay, how are you guys going to build that? Are you going to build it with stucco or are you going to build it with brick? Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Madam President. Yes, sir. Mr. Diaz. Dr. Fields, you had brought up that at one of the failed bonds, there was, there was transportation items. Is that right? It was a suggestion. Yes, sir. Okay. On that particular bond, a transportation satellite was brought up. Okay. Um, so we, I think we all know this. So, you know, choice doesn't go far enough if there isn't access, right? So do we, you know, we didn't talk about transportation in this setting. Do we have transportation issues that should be addressed? So knowing that, knowing that the, the intent is to ensure that every child has easy access, but also knowing that every campus can't be everything. So each campus uh, theoretically could have its own uh, identity specialties, so on and so forth, if that's the, the route we decide to go. So do we have the transportation infrastructure in place to ensure that we reduce dead miles, obviously, but more importantly, that we get students there quickly, safely? Is that something that we should be considering as a sub conversation to one of these points? I would say to answer your, your question even more broadly than just the transportation aspect, we've come up with almost 40 people through you guys' input principals input and recommendations of people in the community and community members that just wanted to be a part of the growth and planning committee to where we have over 40 individuals that should be there on March 15th to start. And um, that's going to be pretty impressive. And they know we're going to social distance and do all the stuff, but they want to be in the conversation. Throughout this process, senior staff will always be a part of it. Those 40 members will always be a part of it, but we're going to bring in transportation to speak about. We're going to bring in, in curriculum and instruction to speak about. We're going to bring in child nutrition. We're going to bring in maintenance so they can talk about some of what they feel are the major priorities in the district as well. So when we do come back to the board, 
it'll be a well-rounded recommendation from everybody in the district. And transportation will be a part of that. May I add that? Yes, sir. I, I just want to add to what Dr. Fields said by saying that um, as I see it, as, as you all as a board are putting together a, a charge for this committee, you all are identifying priorities like access, access to programs. How, how can you achieve that if you aren't thinking about transportation? When Helen talked about the 2016 bond, she mentioned that one of the key initiatives in that bond five years ago was the idea of creating, um, instead of having a centralized kitchen with serving kitchens, making an initiative to, to create a standalone, a full service kitchen at every campus or as many campuses as possible. To me, the, the charge behind that is student wellness. What's best for your students, you know, for their health and wellness? You implement that, you create that by addressing a kitchen issue. And so I think that's really where we are right now is thinking about the framework for that charge and then what undergirds that, what the committee's gonna talk about is what projects have to happen to help realize that charge. So um, I just was going to say that uh, there's, uh, as we move towards the 15th, um, the, the committee members from the board are going to have an opportunity to look at some other area schools that'll kind of further some thinking beyond just sort of what's equity within Judson versus equity outside of Judson. Um, so that'll help get us ready for the 15th. Um, uh, Dr. Fields mentioned earlier, there's an updated demographic study going, so that's going to be information that'll be shared with the uh, committee and ultimately with you all as well. And um, we just, you know, we went a little bit over on our time tonight, but we're certainly appreciative of all of your work uh, and want to be sure from this point that you're thinking about sort of, uh, before you leave, um, sort of how you'd want to identify priorities of all of the notes that have been taken. I think I think that would work best because otherwise I don't you don't have to do that and then okay. try to come back up. Right. And and that's why we're here to help sort of re explain any of the notes if you need it. Absolutely. Okay, then if there's no other business to attend to, this meeting is adjourned at six fifty five. Fifty four. All right. Thank you guys.